In the periodic table, there are just over 100 different kinds of atoms, not counting the stable isotopes. If they couldn't mix or combine in different combinations, the universe would be filled with just 100 different piles of these different atoms. Piles of silicon, piles of aluminum, piles of lead, ponds of mercury, whole atmospheres of nothing but hydrogen or neon gas. But they do mix and they do combine and form some 14 to 15 million different substances. Some substances are pure chemical elements, the silicon, the lead, the aluminum we just talked about, substances straight off the periodic table of the elements. Pure elements not combined with anything else, which doesn't happen very often in nature. Pure element substances like these are separated out in factories and laboratories. Pure elements. But most other substances are compounds. A compound is two or more elements that have been chemically compounded together. And when compounded together, they lose all of the individual characteristics they had individually and form completely new substances. Pure hydrogen is fused together with pure oxygen to form the compound called water, which is something completely different than hydrogen and oxygen just mixing together. Or take the ferociously reactive metal sodium and compound it with poisonous chlorine gas. The reaction between the two produces sodium chloride, table salt, something very different than explosive metal and poisonous gas. Compounds are joined together by a strong chemical reaction, usually heat or chemicals and they can be separated out again only by another strong chemical reaction, usually heat or chemicals. For a chemical reaction to occur, there must be a change in the compound. Therefore, not everything that looks like a chemical reaction necessarily is a chemical reaction. For example, when you pour soda, it fizzes as the carbon dioxide is released from the solution. The cola is already super saturated with carbon dioxide gas, kept under pressure, just waiting to get out, either by slowly making its way to the surface, or by clustering around a bumpy surface, or a scratch in the glass, or metal, or any imperfect surface. It's called nucleation, meaning to form around a nucleus, or to cluster around a nucleus, like electrons cluster around the nucleus of an atom. Nucleation is the process that makes snowflakes. It's a mechanical or physical reaction, not a chemical reaction. Our earlier experiment of changing vinegar and soda into carbon dioxide and water was an example of a chemical reaction. Here you can see nucleation happening as the carbon dioxide bubbles attach themselves to your finger in a glass of soda. Your finger becomes the nucleation site. So dropping just about anything into soda, including salt or sand, will make it nucleate and fizz. But the surface of the mint Mentos candies are particularly suited for developing carbon dioxide bubbles. These electron microscope pictures from the American Journal of Physics shows the millions of microscopic bumps, each one acting as a perfect nucleation site where carbon dioxide bubbles will instantly cluster and release to the surface. Eight or nine mint mentos dropped in at once start sinking and the carbon dioxide instantly finds these nucleation sites. Millions of bubbles rush to the surface, pushing the liquid ahead of them and forming a geyser of sticky soda pop. All experiments indicate that the greatest geyser is achieved using diet cola, as the aspartame provides a slicker mechanical surface tension than sugar, and nearly any diet soda will do. Here is a liter of clear diet soda, so you can see the reaction.
Nucleation is an example of a mechanical reaction, not a chemical reaction, because none of the compounds in the equation were actually changed in the reaction. Different substances can also form something called a mixture, something we are all very familiar with. A mixture is the blending together of two different substances that do not chemically combine. No strong chemical reaction here. Like mixing distilled water with salt. The water is pure water molecules, and the salt is nothing but sodium chloride. When mixed together, they don't change, they just mix. A mixture. There's nearly an infinite number of mixtures. Sand is a mixture of salts and minerals. Air is a mixture of gases like oxygen and nitrogen. Concrete is a mixture. So is tap water and chocolate and gasoline, bird seed, milk, rocks. Lemonade is a mixture. It's a mixture of all kinds of things like tap water, sugar, and lemon. Liquid mixtures are sometimes called solutions. Like this package makes a lemonade solution. It mixes water with sugar and lemon flavoring, but the components remain separate and do not chemically react or chemically combine. So a compound is the chemical union of two or more different elements through a chemical reaction. And when they join, they form a molecule. Molecule is the French word meaning a tiny piece. They form a tiny piece of that substance. In fact, the tiniest piece of that substance. And how tiny? Well, there are a lot of water molecules in this glass of water. In fact, more than you can possibly imagine. Really? Yes, in fact, there are so many that the odds are very high that the glass of water you drink today will contain some of the exact same water molecules that were in the glass of water belonging to Abraham Lincoln on the day he took office. Impossible, you might think? Ridiculous even to consider? Well, Professor Jeffrey Rosenthal at the University of Toronto has calculated that there are way more tiny water molecules in just one glass of water then there are whole cups of water in all the world's oceans and lakes combined. Dr. Rosenthal concludes that the odds are virtually 100% that every cup of water you drink contains at least one tiny water molecule that was in Abraham Lincoln's water glass on the day he took office. In fact, it probably contains about 2,000 of those same water molecules. So, Pharaoh, Alexander the Great, Adam, Abraham Lincoln, Noah, and Jesus in every cup of coffee, every glass of water, or every soda pop you drink, the odds are nearly certain that you are drinking at least one water molecule that was previously drank by any one of these people. That's how tiny and abundant molecules are. Tiny water molecules are made by the chemical combination of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that chemically combine to form one water molecule, the tiniest piece of water you can get. If you divide it any further, the tiny piece, the water molecule, breaks apart and you no longer have water. Likewise, some of the chemical elements, like oxygen, like to bond together and form molecules of pure oxygen. When a molecule of oxygen is broken down, you're back to just one atom of oxygen again. These terms, element, molecule, and compound, can be kind of confusing. Well, we know what an element is. It's the stuff on the periodic table. And if you combine two or more of them together, you get a molecule. 
Combine different kinds together and you get a compound. Still a molecule, but a compound molecule. And how do molecules stick together again? The main group elements make every effort to fill their outer shell with eight electrons, and they are happiest, or most stable, when this happens. And here are the two main ways they become stable. The first way is through valence bonding, actually covalent bonding, because the prefix co means to share or together, like a co-pilot is someone who shares the cockpit with the pilot and a co-worker is someone who shares the workplace. And covalent bonding is atoms sharing their valence electrons to form molecules, tiny pieces of various compounds like water, ammonia, butane, gas, or caffeine. Covalent bonds occur with all the nonmetals, elements on that side of the periodic table, and are the most common bond in chemistry. 98% of all living organisms, including you and me, are made up of the 18 or so nonmetals on that side of the periodic table where covalent bonding occurs. Covalent bonding happens when atoms share their electrons. In Bohr's model of the atom, there are several energy level shells. and the first energy level shell will hold two electrons. Hydrogen has a single valence electron in the outer shell and wants another one to complete it. So each hydrogen atom will share their electron, completing the first valence shell and thus become like the noble gases, stable. Water. Water combines in definite proportions of two hydrogens and one oxygen. Hydrogen has one electron and needs to pick up another one. Oxygen has six valence electrons, being in the sixth column, and wants to pick up two more to make eight. By sharing hydrogen's electrons, oxygen now has eight, and each hydrogen gets another, and the molecule is made noble or stable, just like the noble gases. Ammonia. Ammonia is often found as a cleaning solution, but it's normally a gas, but is dissolved in a liquid for home use. By experimenting, scientists know that ammonia combines in the definite proportions of one nitrogen to three hydrogen atoms. Nitrogen is in group five, so there's one, two, three, four, five valence electrons in the outer shell and needs three electrons to complete the noble eight. Hydrogen is in group one and has one and wants one to complete that first valence shell. By sharing their electrons, nitrogen picks up one from each hydrogen and makes eight. Nitrogen shares three and has one lone pair. It is now a stable, noble molecule. Although more complex kind of bonding can occur, this is simple covalent bonding sharing of electrons, and it occurs between all the non-metals, elements on that side of the periodic table, and is the most common type of bond. The other way that atoms bond is not by sharing, but by actually handing over an electron, which is a bit different than just sharing. You'll remember that ions are electrically charged atoms. If you take away some electrons, the atom becomes positively charged, a cation. If you add electrons, the atom becomes negatively charged, an anion. By completely handing over or transferring the electron, the atoms are now charged. They are ions and no longer electrically neutral. And opposite charged ions are attracted to each other, just like magnets. Not surprisingly, this bonding between ions is called ionic bonding. It's also called electrovalent bonding because they become electrically charged. In general, ionic bonding happens between a nonmetal on this side of the table 
and a metal on this side of the table. And oddly enough, they have a tendency to form salts when they do. For example, sodium with one electron hands it over to chlorine over here to form sodium chloride, normal table salt. And now each atom is stable with eight valence electrons. Ferocious alkali metals are in family 1 and thus tend to lose that negative electron to nonmetals on the right side. And when they do, oh, there are now more positive protons than negative electrons, and the ferocious metal becomes an ion, a cation, an atom with a shocking positive charge. <coughs> So, nonmetals join with other nonmetals using covalent bonds, and metals join to nonmetals using ionic bonds. But what if metals want to join with other metals? These are complex and less understood bonds, and the theory is very similar to J.J. Thompson's old plum pudding model. The metal atoms, like, say, iron, lose most of their electrons in what everybody calls a sea of negative electrons, and the positive atoms become electrically embedded in the sea, like plums in the plum pudding, or chocolate chips in the cookie dough background. This theory helps give some sort of explanation as to why metal alloys are so bendable or malleable, and why they are so electrically conductive. Metal sodium bonds to metal sodium using metallic bonding. Metal sodium bonds to metal iron with metallic bonding. Metal sodium bonds to non-metal fluorine with ionic bonding. And non-metal fluorine bonds to non-metal fluorine with covalent bonding. So, in general, the basic bonding types are the weaker covalent bonding over here, the electric ionic bonding between these two sides, which form very strong bonds, metallic bonding between the metal elements, and of course, the noble gases like to stay by themselves, so they generally don't form any bonds at all. Although the word molecule can refer to the combination of any two atoms, Scientists usually reserve that word, molecule, for covalent type compounds only. It is very seldom used in referring to ionic compounds. So far, we've been representing atoms and molecules using their valence configurations. But scientists have a simpler way to show bonded molecules. They use Lewis dot diagrams, named after the chemist Gilbert Lewis, who introduced them in his 1916 paper titled, The Atom and the Molecule. Lewis dot diagrams are fairly easy, and they illustrate the outer valence shell electrons using, well, dots. Lithium in group one, with one valence electron and one dot. Beryllium with two dots. Boron in group three, with three valence electrons, carbon with 4, nitrogen 5, oxygen 6, fluorine 7, and finally neon with a happy 8 valence electrons. Here's how the previous three molecules we discussed look using Lewis dot diagrams. Hydrogen has only one electron and needs only one, so it can form only one bond. We draw the letter of the element H, in this case for hydrogen, and one dot for the one valence electron. Here's the other hydrogen atom it will link up with, and a line between the two shows the bond. From this elaborate electron configuration picture to this simple dot diagram. Water. Oxygen has six valence electrons because it is in group six, and here are six dots representing those valence electrons. Oxygen wants to pick up two more, and hydrogen wants to share its single electron and have two itself. These two lone atom pairs stay by themselves. Oxygen gets eight, hydrogen gets two, and everyone gets water. 
from this to this. Ammonia. The Lewis dot diagram for the ammonia molecule looks like this. Here's the central nitrogen atom with its five valence electrons around it. Three hydrogen atoms share their single electron, making a noble eight. Another method is to simply draw a line to show the bond and the lone pair. Nitrogen fills a shell with eight, and since hydrogen only has two in its outer shell, it becomes stable also. From this to this. Now, nobody has ever seen a real molecule, but we see 3D models of molecules all the time. How do they know what they look like? Well, they use their imaginations and known chemical theories. For covalent bonds, they largely use the Vesper theory to determine how the covalent bonded atoms arrange themselves. Vesper stands for Valence Shell Electron Pair Repulsion. The idea is that while atoms are attracted by their need to share valence electrons, at the same time, the negatively charged electrons are repelled from each other and want to get as far away from each other as possible. This is largely how they determine the shapes of molecules. They are held by their attraction to the central atom while being repulsed by their own like charges, just like magnets. In covalent bonding, Two atoms joining the central atom will join 180 degrees apart as far away as they can get. Three atoms joining an atom will usually form like this and stay 120 degrees apart. Four will form like this. Five atoms will probably form like this. And six will cause the atoms in the molecule to form something like this. All atoms staying as far away from each other due to the repulsion, but held to the main atom through covalent bonding. This ball and stick model is one of the most common ways to model covalent bonded molecules in 3D. And here are our three molecule examples. Hydrogen goes from this Lewis dot diagram into this ball and stick model. Same information in a different shape. Water goes from this to this. Here is the single oxygen atom, and here are the two hydrogens, and this stick represents the bond between them. The 3D model for ammonia goes from the Lewis dot diagram to this, a single nitrogen atom connected to three hydrogen atoms. A variation on the ball and stick model is called the space filling model, which shows the same molecule but does away with the stick, thus saving space. Here is ammonia in four different models, all modeling the same molecule. Ball and stick, space filling, the stick model only, and for the especially thrifty minded, the wireframe model. Often you'll see this kind of model called the skeletal formula. It is to a real molecule like a stick figure is to a real person. It usually takes a few years in chemistry before a person becomes really good at reading skeletal formulas as all the complex carbon and hydrogen atoms are left off. Skeletal formulas convey only the essential chemical information of the molecule with a minimum effort and complexity. When chemists talk to one another about molecules, this is generally the model drawing they use, as it is fast and relatively easy to do by hand. So, Vesper theory is to show structure of covalent bonds. But what about the structure for ionic bonding and metallic bonding? Well, these models are a little different. 
Since the electrical attraction between these bonds makes them particularly strong, they are modeled in tight packages, forming strong crystal-like patterns. Remember, ions are electrically charged atoms because they've gained or lost an electron. Their electrical attraction operates in all directions, so they pull together in clumps or frameworks, which is different than the straight directional bond of covalent bonds. Here is the element gold, with the gold atoms electrically bonded in the lattice network shown here in white. Here is the same element, but we've made the electrical bonds invisible. And here is gold using the space filling model. Notice how tight the atoms crowd together in these kind of bonds. Probably the most famous molecule is this complex model of the large DNA molecule discovered by Francis Crick and J.D. Watson. DNA is the molecule in all living organisms responsible for storing the blueprint information on how to build that particular organism. There are many other kinds of molecular bonding and molecular models from the very simple to the very complex. Ionic bonding, cations and anions attracting as many ions of the opposite charge as they can pack around themselves because their negative and positive charges attract each other from all directions. Covalent bonds are more specific and directional in their attraction and are often called directional bonding, not as crammed together. These are the common theories of how molecules attract one another and these theories have changed throughout time and will no doubt continue to change as more information becomes available.